Hi everyone and welcome back to A Story of Light, A Musical Journey in 19 Days. Today is day 16 and um, I, I, oh, I didn't do the intro yesterday but maybe it's good if I do the intro just because uh, it gives people a little bit of maybe an extra few seconds to arrive in case anyone um, is running late to the to the stream. Um, so if you're if you've if you've been following along the story, thank you so much for going on this big adventure with me. Uh, and if this is your first time watching, you're very welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is Luke Slot. I'm a musician in Dublin, and I mainly focus on setting to music, the Baha'i sacred writings. And I'm doing these daily live streams uh, for the first. 19 days of March for about 15 to 20 minutes each day uh, and each each live stream consists of a bit of storytelling and a live song at the end here at AP Studios in Dublin and this is all in preparation for the release of my new album Home of Light which is coming out later this year and it's a it's a collection of new songs based on the writings of Abdul Baha and if you're not familiar with Abdul Baha he was the the son of Baha'u'llah the founder of the Baha'i faith and uh, he's really cherished as an example and a role model to Baha'is and friends around the world. And 2021 marks the centenary of his passing, hence the new album in his honour uh, coming a bit later this year. So um, as usual, all, all of the, the previous episodes are posted on YouTube if you want to if you want to check them out at any time. Uh, I really, really appreciate you so much uh, coming along, following the story with me. It's uh, it's such a special experience for me to, to tell this story um, and really just to share what I've been learning about the, the story of Abdul Baha. So uh, for today's episode, I actually want to uh, switch gears a little bit and I wanted to share with you the story of a young woman from New Jersey who, uh, who was destined to become one of the great heroes of this story. Uh, her name was May Bowles and she would later become known by her married name, May Maxwell. And May was, May grew up in a, in a, a very wealthy family of bankers who were uh, well known and very well respected in the, the New York, New Jersey area. But when, when May was 24 years old, she moved with her mother and brother to Paris in order to facilitate her, her brother's college studies. And so May spent a significant portion of her life in Paris. But uh, and as a young as a young woman, May had developed this um, very deep interest in studying the the world's religions and various kinds of philosophies. And as she grew older, she uh, she began to develop this this deep sense through her personal studies, through her reflections, her meditations, through dreams that she had. She began to get this sense that that some profound spiritual light had come into the world and she was going to find it. But along, kind of in parallel with her, um, with her growing spiritual, philosophical interests, May also suffered from growing health issues, which actually got worse after the family's move to Paris. And in, in, within a few years of the family's move, uh, May was completely confined to her bed in the fa in the family's Paris apartment. And when May was 28 years old, a family friend uh, who was traveling across Europe decided to stop in Paris and uh, visit May and her mother. And that friend happened to be the great American multi-millionaire philanthropist, Phoebe Hurst, who is known in uh, American history as one of the, the really the greatest contributors to the development of schools and universities and education in the US. Uh, she was also a key figure in the, the movement to gain the voting right for women. And, uh, and Phoebe Hurst was really a, like she's a deeply beloved figure in the history of American philanthropy. And Phoebe Hurst was, was traveling across Europe with the whole entourage of, uh, of about a dozen or so people. And she decided to stop in, in Paris to, to visit May and her mother. And when May, who was lying in her bed, asked this group of friends about the purpose of their, of their journey, there was a young New Yorker in the group whose name was Lua Getzinger, who spoke up and said to May, we're going to Akka in Palestine 
to see a prisoner who holds the key to peace. They were going to see Abdul Baha. And so this was this was December 1898. Baha'u'llah had passed away a few years previously. And Abdul Baha was still nominally a prisoner in Akka. And really he was in the throes of all this trouble that his brother was causing for him. But a, a few months before this, Phoebe Hurst had met this young New Yorker, Lua Getzinger, who had told her the story of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. And Phoebe Hurst, being a being a, a woman with vast resources at her behest, decided that she was going to invite a few friends and go on a trip to the Holy Land to meet with Abdul Baha in person. And when she saw May sick in bed in Paris, she agreed that perhaps a change of air would be good for May's health. And she invited May to join them uh, on the trip. And so May set, a, set off from Paris as a guest of Phoebe Hurst, and uh, along with her entourage of people, uh, including Lua Getzinger and also Phoebe's butler, Robert Turner, who was destined to become uh, the world's first African-American Baha'i, and they, they made their way to the Holy Land. But no matter how full of excitement and curiosity May was uh, at the prospect of meeting this prisoner that Lua had told her about, Nothing could have really prepared May for the encounter itself, because when they arrived in the Holy Land, the moment that May looked at the face of Abdul Baha, she recognised him from a dream that she had had years before. And May was so completely overcome with emotion at the recognition of this face that <laughs> as she stood in the room, her legs buckled from under her and she fell to the floor. And May has actually left a description of that first meeting of those first Western pilgrims uh, meeting Abdul Baha for the first time. So, uh, Antimo, can you put up the first slide, please? So... This is May's description of their first meeting with Abdul Baha. He gently raised me and seated me beside him, all the while saying some loving words in Persian, in a voice that shook my heart. Of that first meeting, I can remember neither joy nor pain nor anything I can name. I had been carried suddenly to too great a height. My soul had come in contact with the Divine Spirit. And this force, so pure, so holy, so mighty, had overwhelmed me. He spoke to each one of us in turn, of ourselves and our lives and those whom we loved. And although his words were so few and so simple, they breathed the spirit of life to our souls. And so May and Phoebe and Robert and Lua and the others spent several days uh, meeting with Abdul Baha uh, and learning about the teachings of his father. And at the end of their visit, uh, Abdul Baha addressed them with these words. So, Antimo, can you put up the, the next slide, please? Now the time has come when we must part. But the separation is only of our bodies. In spirit we are united. Ye are the lights which shall be diffused. Ye are the waves of that sea which shall spread and overflow the world. Each wave is precious to me, and my nostrils shall be gladdened by your fragrance. Another commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, even as I love you. Great mercy and blessings are promised to the peoples of your land but on one condition, that their hearts are filled with the fire of love, that they live in perfect kindness and harmony, like one soul in different bodies. Never forget this. Look at one another with the eyes of perfection. Look at me, follow me, be as I am. Behold a candle and how it gives its light. It weeps its life away drop by drop in order, in order to give forth its flame of light. And with that, Phoebe and Robert and Lua and their fellow Americans returned to the US and May 
returned to Paris. And she didn't really know what to do. She was still in quite fragile health. She had just had this extraordinary adventure meeting Abdu'l-Bahá in the Holy Land, and she didn't really know what to do. And around this time, May's mother had decided that it would be good for the family to, to move out of Paris and move to the French countryside. And she was trying to persuade May to come and, and live with her in the French countryside. But Abdu'l-Bahá had given May one sole mission. Do not leave Paris. And so May told her mother that she would she would join her in the countryside when the time was right, but for now she needed to stay in Paris. And so May simply began to just open her home and friends would come over and together they would, they would discuss the teachings of Baha'u'llah. And May would write letters to Abdu'l-Bahá informing him of the details of these meetings and the friends she was making and the conversations they were having. And Abdu'l-Bahá would would write back to May and, and offer words of encouragement, but always reminding her of that simple mission, those four words, do not leave Paris. And one evening, a friend of May's arrived for dinner, and she brought with her a, a young Englishman that she had met and had felt impelled to, to invite to May's to join them for dinner. And this young Englishman he was, a, was a charming, handsome a uh, young businessman who had a successful textile business that, that extended all the way from England to America, and his name was Thomas Breakwell. And so May and her friend and this young Englishman, Thomas Breakwell, uh, had dinner together, and they sat for hours talking into the night, talking about all sorts of things. They probably talked about, well, they probably talked about May's various health issues, and they probably talked about Thomas's successful business enterprises, and they probably talked about all the various aspects of being a, an American and an Englishman living in Paris at the, at the turn of the century. But in the entire course of their conversation, not a single word was spoken about Baha'u'llah or Abdu'l-Bahá. Nothing. And when they finished dinner, Thomas thanked May and said goodbye. But as Thomas walked away from May's door that night, there was something that kept pulling at his mind. It had, it had been such a pleasant evening, such a such delightful company, such engaging conversation. But Thomas had this strange feeling, as if May had not told him something. Uh, this feeling that something important had been left out of the conversation, and he walked off across the dark streets of Paris. And the next morning there was a knock on May's door, and when May opened the door, Thomas was standing there with a mingling of light and tears in his eyes. And he said to May the following, so Antimo, can you put up the next slide, please? When I was here yesterday, I felt a power, an influence, that I had felt once before in my life, when for a period of three months I was continually in communion with God. I felt during that time like one moving in a rarefied atmosphere of light and beauty. My heart was on fire with love for the Supreme Beloved. I felt at peace, at one with all my fellow men. Yesterday, when I left you, I went alone down the Champs-Élysées. The air was warm and heavy, not a leaf was stirring, when suddenly a wind struck me and whirled around me, and in that wind a voice said, with an indescribable sweetness and penetration, Christ has come again. And Thomas looked into May's eyes in desperation, and he said to her, May, Am I going insane? And May said, no. You have just gone sane. And so Thomas Breakwell sat with May for the following three days and she told him the story of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Bahá. And on the third day, Thomas sent a telegram to Abdu'l-Bahá with a very short message, and all it said was, 
My Lord, I believe. Forgive me. And there was a painful meaning behind that message which was to become clear later on. But what was so mysterious was that just as Thomas Breakwell sent off his telegram to Abdul Baha, an envelope arrived for May and it was postmarked from Akka, Palestine. And when May opened up that envelope, she found a letter that consisted of one single sentence. You may now leave Paris. So soon enough, Thomas Breakwell himself set out from Paris for the Holy Land to meet with Abdul Baha. And just like May several months before him, he felt like he had come home. But it was in the presence of Abdul Baha that Thomas's, the meaning of Thomas's telegram became clear. His success in business had, uh, had expanded all the way from England to America, where he had a, 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 t- a successful textile mill in the southern United States. But that textile mill was run on child labour. And when Thomas asked Abdul Baha what he should do, Abdul Baha immediately said to him, Cable your resignation. And that's exactly what Thomas Breakwell did. He turned his back on all the wealth that he had accumulated by those means, and he devoted the remainder of his life to the teachings of Baha'u'llah. And there's a beautiful description of Thomas Breakwell, which I'd love to share with you today, uh, Antimo. If you could put up the, the, the next slide. This, is, this was written by Violette Nachjavani. Thomas Breakwell was like a comet that blazed above the skies of Paris at the turn of the century. None could equal his ardour and sincerity. None could match the fervour of his faith. His is the story that will be forever associated with the mystery of Abdul Baha's instructions to May to stay in the French capital at all costs that summer. His acceptance of the cause was the fruit of her obedience. So these early Western pilgrims, May... Phoebe, Lua, Robert, Thomas, these were like candles that Abdul Baha was lighting and sending out into the world to pass their flame on to others. With, with Phoebe and Robert and Lua, he had, he had lit these flames in America. With May, he had lit one in France. And now with Thomas, he had lit one among the people of England too. And there's a beautiful story about Thomas Breakwell. And later on in the year, Uh, As part of the release of the album, I'm going to release a song based on a a letter, a tablet by Abdul Baha that was dedicated to Thomas Breakwell. And um, there's a beautiful, heartbreaking story behind that tablet. Um, But I'm looking forward to sharing that that song with you later in the year. But in the meantime, I wanted to finish today's episode with uh, uh, another prayer written by Abdul Baha. So... um, So if you're fasting today, I hope you have a good fast and uh, I hope you'll join me tomorrow for day uh, 17 of A Story of Light. Thank you so much for watching. This piece is called Fire. of it setteth in motion all the earth till the blast of it setteth in motion all the earth oh thou my lord kindle the light of thy love in every heart breathe into men's souls the spirit of thine
knowledge Call thou to life Those who dwell In their tombs Warn thou the prideful Make happiness worldwide Send down thy crystal waters And in the assemblage of manifest splendors Pass round that cup Which is tempered at the camphor fountain Oh God, my God, increase thou this fire. Oh God, my God, as day followeth day, till the blast of it setteth in motion. Till the blast of it setteth in motion